true cases. The Division of Public Police engages in a pattern and practice of using excessive force. Real victims. No, he's not all right. They were pounding him in the head. Examined by two experienced investigators. These cars shouldn't say to protect and serve, or they should be adding themselves in the bottom. It should say to protect and serve ourselves. The Miss Clues. Austin School Police acknowledging today that they should have done more to investigate. The cover-ups. It was a cover-up, and I, I, I think that uh, people were looking out for their own scam. From the extensive work by Salvatore Restorelli and Ira Robbins comes the Archangels of Justice case files. I am your host, Joe Ross, and I will be your guide on this quest to find the answers and give a voice to the victims of these tragic cases. Hello to our listeners, and thank you again for joining us wherever you are for the Archangels of Justice Case Files. This is the seventh episode in an eight-part series of our first season looking into the Sheena Morris case. We are down to the final two episodes and hope that if you've made it this far, you've enjoyed the coverage of this case. Our downloads have picked up every week, and we really appreciate all the help you listeners have given us as we grow this podcast. Without you, it would not be possible to get our message out to the public. So from everyone here at the Archangels of Justice, we'd like to say thank you. As we move to our penultimate episode, we will be reviewing the findings from the Archangels of Justice affidavit. I'll be joined in this episode by Kelly Osborne, Sheena's mother, Dave Morris, Sheena's father, for a quick talk at the beginning, and at the end, I will speak with Lee Williams from the Herald Tribune. But for most of this episode, I'll be talking with our two archangels, Sal and Ira, as I'll be focusing mostly on their investigation. But first, a message from our sponsors. Do you want to launch your own podcast or host your own media? Then you should be looking at Blueberry.com. That's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y.com. With no third-party sites to log into, you remain in control by never leaving your website and having an iTunes and SoundCloud-friendly RSS feed. Get your 30-day free trial by just typing AOJ podcast when you check out and you could be broadcasting your very own media today. Our other sponsor is totalfrontpage.com. Did you know that approximately 95% of purchase decisions are made on the first pages of search engines? Totalfrontpage.com knows this and they can do what no other digital marketing company does. Put your company name in the autocomplete box of Google and Bing so that searchers see your business before they see any other company. Your business will appear in most, if not all, organic listings. No competitors, just you. If you'd like to know more about this groundbreaking service, you can check out their website, totalfrontpage.com. Or for a free consultation, mention AOJ Podcast in the subject line when you email info at totalfrontpage.com. Act today because once these search terms are purchased, they cannot be used by any other company. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting this podcast. As we move into our next season, we'll be expanding the sponsorships. But the early help from both Total Front Page and Blueberry is what got this podcast off the ground. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please let them know your appreciation. With that, I give you Episode 7 in the Sheena Morris case. After the FDLE released their report, the Florida State's Attorney's Office released their findings. Reading through the report, many of the same things are repeated because they use the same investigators for both reports. Basically, instead of the FDLE and the Florida State's Attorney's Office running their own separate investigations then releasing their independent findings, both state agencies, in another attempt to sway public opinion, released their findings based on hearsay evidence and incomplete reports. Kelly and Dave talk about what they thought the intention was behind these two reports. What, what they did, Joe, is they said, you know what, fine. They called out the public, you know, and made this this public outrage. I'm going to fix them. I'm going to fix them. We're going to go ahead and we're going to investigate the daylights out of Sheena Morris. Not Joe Genoese, not the events that happened that night. They wanted to investigate Sheena back when she's 14 years old. They wanted, they wanted to dig up anything that they could, and they had a great time doing it. They didn't They didn't solve where was Genoese that night. And this was them enjoying themselves, dragging this out for a year and a half of us asking, have they concluded this yet? And them just having the thrill of their life, waiting to give us that phone call when they're going to publicly assassinate us and Sheena. 
Well, if you remember correctly, Lee Williams had wrote an article, and he had asked the FDLE if they were going to come in and reopen this investigation, and they flat out came, I mean, I believe the headline read that the state had balked at reopening Sheena's investigation, and the very next day in the same newspaper, Lee Williams writes another story that the FBI actually comes forward and says that they will reopen the investigation if they are invited in by the Bradenton Beach Police Department. So they're saying that they actually will do the investigation, but they need an invite. Now, on That's Thursday, right. this is three days in a row, three articles, Lee Williams, Sarasota Herald Tribune. Third day, the state of Florida says, we will reopen this investigation. So, I mean, you're talking three days. So one day they're saying, no, we have no reason to reopen this investigation. The following day, the FBI says, we will. The third day, like they want to shut down any outsider, which would be somebody on a federal level to come in. They don't want that going on. They want to keep it in-house down there in the state of Florida. The third day, an article comes out, and that's when the FDLE agrees. We will reopen the investigation and do it. These are three articles that can be found in the, in the Herald Tribune. Three days in a row. Sheena's family is beside themselves. After everything they had to go through to get this case reinvestigated, this was how Florida's highest law enforcement agency saw the events and the investigation done by Detective Diaz. They have no idea where to go from here. All they want is a fair investigation into the events of that night and early morning. Many media outlets reported that Sheena's family had given up. But although they were discouraged, they held out hope that someone would reinvestigate the case. In 2014, and a year after the FDLE released their report, Kelly was contacted by a recently formed duo called the Archangels of Justice. I have Sal and Ira talk about what made them want to work on this case. Well, interesting. Going back now all these years, Ira and I had been involved in a number of cases where um, police departments weren't properly investigating cases or uh, uh, selectively enforcing certain things. And uh, we had started the um, Facebook page, you know, and, and people were reaching out to us. And at some point, um, when we opened up that Facebook page, Archangels of Justice, um, mm -hmm. Kelly reached out to us, Kelly Osborne. And I remember the first conversation I had with Kelly on the phone. Ira was in Florida, and we were working on a couple of cases at that time together. And I spent about a half hour on the phone with her, and she was explaining to me what had happened to her daughter and um, how the investigations had, um, you know, gone awry, you know, the best I can figure, you know, because none of the investigations are done properly. So I asked her, I said, you know, if you'd like us to take a look at it, send me everything you can. Well, Kelly had everything imaginable. So she sent all the photographs, all the reports from FDLE and um, the police department, Bradenton Beach and the state attorney. And then little by little, she started sending me the clips from um, Dr. Phil's show and then the other TV show that had picked up Sheena's case. And the more we looked at this, the, the more disgusted I got, and I know Ira did as well, but he could tell you, uh, especially when I started looking at all the crime scene photographs and comparing those photographs to the crime scene report and the police reports and saying, they've, they've got pictures of things here that they should have processed. They have pictures of areas that they should have collected evidence. They didn't, but yet they took photographs, but they collected nothing. So that's how we got involved in it. It was, a, it was one of those cases that seemed to um, yell at us that this was a true case of, of police misconduct and negligence, and that's what got us going on Sheena's case. Um, from what we saw on the uh from the reports and everything and the reports that we've written um there are various different crimes that have been committed here they wrote false reports writing false reports is a federal crime it's also probably a state crime in florida a conspiracy either overtly or or just because it just happened 
with each other is a crime. Obstruction of justice is a federal crime. And selective enforcement, where the government works in behalf of one uh, class of people, law enforcement, against the citizens, is another crime. And then as we started to read this more and more, it became obvious that Officer Michael Bazell and uh, John Tuscuri from the Brayton and Beach Police Department had committed uh, false reports and, and conspired with each other. Then along comes Diaz, the uh, useless detective sergeant. He conspired with these all with these guys to get rid of it. Then Valden Shane Polar, the resident agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Special Agent Carl Shedlock and Special Agent Chris Seamers all got together and committed the same violations. Then former Florida Department of Law Enforcement polygraph examiner Sharon L. Fiola did the same thing. And State Attorney Ed Brodsky uh, oversaw State Attorney Arthur Brown, and they all all got together. They, 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 and, and Brodsky made the statement in, in, in the media that if, in fact, they ever found something new, that they would reopen the investigation. Um, that was in the uh, Herald Tribune on uh, August 22nd, 2015 from Sarasota, Florida. State Attorney Ed Brodsky is backing Brown and his findings and says that if the new evidence surfaces, his team would review it. Yeah, I'll bet they'll review it just the way they reviewed this other stuff. And, you know, it, it, it stinks so badly. And then what we did is we filed a complaint, a copy of the affidavit with the um, uh, United States congressman in that district, and that was Representative Vern Buchanan, on April 21st of 2015. And we, we notified him at that time that we're not asking him to file a complaint, but to just send a letter to the FBI and ask them, because we had filed it with the FBI also, and ask them to please keep your eye on what's going on here because uh, you know we don't want this swept under the carpet. After Sal and Ira began reviewing this case, they not only found many things wrong with the Bradenton Beach Police's investigation, but with both the FDLE and state attorney's reports. After Sal and Ira did an extensive investigation, they filed a sworn affidavit with the FBI. This affidavit will be available shortly in the show notes at archangelsofjustice.org. But I'd like to go through the report and explain all the laws that were broken by the Bradenton Beach Police that the FDLE and Florida State Attorney's Office were not able to find in their investigation. After you hear what the Archangels found, you will understand why the Bradenton Beach Police and the FDLE both had motive to create this false narrative. I will also be discussing with Sal and Ira what it would actually take to charge people with these crimes. This report begins with the criminal actions of Officers Basil and Security, who on January 3, 2009, three days after Sheena's death, they filed their report of their contact with Sheena Morris. That report not only contains false information not supported by other hotel guests or crime scene photos, but omits critical facts. The specific Florida state statute that was broken reads in part that when a law enforcement officer investigates an allegation that an incident of domestic violence occurred, whether or not an arrest is made, that officer shall make a written police report that is complete and clearly indicates the alleged offense of domestic violence. Such a report shall be given to the officer's supervisor and filed with the law enforcement agency in a manner that will permit data on domestic violence cases to be compiled. Such a report must include A, a description of the injuries observed, if any, B, if a law enforcement officer decides not to make an arrest or decides to arrest two or more parties, the officer shall include in the report the grounds for not arresting anyone or for arresting two or more parties, and C, a statement that a copy of the legal rights and remedies notice was given to the victim. Whenever possible, the law enforcement officer shall obtain a written statement from the victim and witnesses concerning the alleged domestic violence. The officer shall submit the report to the supervisor. So essentially what this is saying is that according to Florida law, officers responding to any type of domestic call are required to file a report regarding the incident. These officers, Basil and Security, knew they had violated Florida law by not filing a report of the incident that day. So three days later, they hastily filed a report. At that time, though, the officers and Bradenton Beach Police 
had no idea Sheena made a 911 call that refuted many of the things stated in their report. Sheena's 911 call, along with the statements from other hotel guests, proved the report officers Basil and Security provided was deceptive. The report appears to be written more to satisfy their supervisors rather than truthfully reporting what they had observed or what was actually said by Sheena Morris. I have Sal talk about this further. No, you have to look at, like we have discussed time and time again, about the, their response to this, this, this domestic was substandard. They knew they were going to a domestic. The people that surrounded that hotel room you know, on either side were the ones that called 911. So it was loud enough for neighboring people to be concerned enough to call the police. And when the police get there, uh, as we mentioned before, they, they see this guy, Joe Genoese, walking down through the stairwell. But they don't bother to even find out who he is, where he's coming from, or if he was even part of the domestic. So that's the first mistake they made. And, and, and it's glaringly obvious their attitude was lackadaisical and unprofessional. Then they get to the room and they see Sheena, who's got has injuries on her body. And she even points out injuries. And again, these two officers take it upon themselves to treat this case as if it's not that important. And Florida statutes require officers to investigate thoroughly any alleged domestic dispute. And in this case, they had a domestic battery, which takes it beyond the level of just a verbal argument, and they did nothing. You know, so the, the statute's clear on what an officer should do. All of these officers, part of their training to be an officer in the state of Florida is to have a 40-hour class on domestic abuse, domestic disturbances, and domestic violence. Obviously, these officers were sleeping during their classes because they did not act accordingly to the policies and procedures set forth by the state of Florida on how to handle a domestic. You take it the next step is is the fact that in, in cl- clearly violating Sheena's civil rights by not enforcing the law. You know, so now you start stepping in, into the USC, the 40, uh, Code 42, 1983 statutes of officers that are uh, negligent or careless in their duties. That's a federal statute that allows a citizen to sue under that, um, under that federal law, a local agency. And, and these, these two guys, they didn't, that's the first mistake right there. It wouldn't, I, I can't even say it's a mistake. I, I have to say it was glaringly a, um, an absolute of their duties. It is very important to note that on February 24th, 2009, less than two months after his dereliction of duty and writing false reports on Sheena's case, Officer Mike Basil was given an official letter of reprimand for not utilizing proper police procedures during a death investigation that had occurred on February 23rd, 2009. That reprimand also confirms that Basil has a history of writing false reports. The most interesting part of this report came from Detective Diaz, which said, quote, My concern with this is we just talked about this liability in our last meeting and not following procedures will cost this department a huge lawsuit in the future, end quote. It appears that the meeting referred to was immediately after the death of Sheena Morris and the resulting police misconduct. Sal expands a little bit more on this incident. The case of a woman found dead in a bathtub, another similar set of circumstances, another younger woman, not quite as young as Sheena, but found dead in a bathtub. And this Mike Basil decides to go to this call and act like he's the, the, the final say-so. He doesn't call out a medical examiner investigator. He doesn't call for a crime scene investigator. He, again, totally decides that he's the knowledgeable expert on the scene and that there's no further investigation necessary. Well, then about a day or two later, Diaz, who's now somehow or another involved in some other supervisory uh, capacity within Bradenton Beach, writes Basil up for not following protocol. And in his written reprimand indicates that we've gotten in trouble for this before, in essence, referring to Sheena's case, because Sheena's case was the only case like this before. And 
you know, that we're going to get sued if we don't start following protocol. Essentially, in summary, is what his letter said. And I know that's in our, our affidavit. So I'm just taking that from memory. But this is an agency, as I mentioned before, and I know Ira has, the chief of police, Special, was a sergeant at Braindon Beach. And during his tenure as a sergeant, he was written up twice for not following protocol. Now, he's the chief of police, and his officers don't follow protocol. And what? He doesn't care. And that's, that's, this is why these people need to be sued. They lost their national accreditation status at that agency a few years back because of their shenanigans. They don't follow protocol. You know, you could write all the policies and procedures you want to get and pass the national accreditation. But if you don't follow them, there should be some serious recourse. Because essentially what you're doing is you're writing a contract with the public and with your officers that they will follow police procedure and protocol. And if they don't, there will be disciplinary action. But when they don't do anything, and there's no disciplinary action to follow up, the public has every right. And these victims like Kelly and uh, Dave and, and her and Kelly's present husband and Sheena and everyone else that suffered the, the deliberate acts of Bradenton Beach and FDLE and the state attorney should be able to sue. And, and it, it, it's just that simple. But we have no ability in this country anymore for, for anybody to have oversight over these people. They do what they want. They write what they want. They say what they want. They indict who they want. They prosecute who they want, irregardless of evidence. And that has to stop. This is the same officer that kissed a rape crisis counselor without her consent. The Archangels of Justice believe that Officer Mike Basil has a history of untruthfulness that demonstrates the conduct of a pathological liar, and his incident with a rape crisis counselor may be an indication that he's a sexual predator. So those are some of the facts about Mike Basil that the FDLE and State Attorney's Office forgot to mention. This officer's deliberate misconduct is essentially being condoned to this day by Florida's highest law enforcement agencies, and they should be held responsible for every case screwed up by Mike Basil, who as recently as July 2016 had another reported incident, this time about getting into a fight at a bar when he was off duty. The Archangel's affidavit then goes on to talk about Detective Diaz, whose wrong assumption and lack of experience initiated an inept investigation. The police dispatcher assigned Detective Diaz to respond to a, quote, suicide investigation in room 525 at the Bridgewalk Resort. Having never investigated a homicide case before and drawing the conclusion of suicide even before arriving at the scene, set the stage for what would ultimately cause the permanent destruction of critical evidence. Detective Diaz states in his report that he spoke with Kelly Osborne and Joe Genoese on January 1st but there is no proof of these calls and is in direct contradiction of statements made by Kelly Osborne. In his report, he also mentions the fact that Genoese committed domestic violence and strong-arm robbery, but again, there is no indication he ever questioned Genoese about it. On January 16th, Detective Diaz closed the case without ever officially interviewing Genoese, and he wrote this, and I'm quoting directly from his report. At this time, I am closing this case as a suicide. I have interviewed the fiancé, Joe Genoese, the mother, Kelly Osborne, and have looked over all the evidence collected. I have no reason to believe that there was any foul play involving the domestic disturbance the night before Sheena Morris was discovered. End quote. That statement is proof that Detective Diaz is either incompetent or falsified his report to cover up the misconduct and false reports of officers Basil and Security. It should be noted, too, that Detective Diaz was the one who originally approved the report written by those officers three days after the fact. And no matter if it's incompetence or corruption, all three of these men are unfit to be law enforcement officers. I have Sal talk about exactly what laws Detective Diaz broke, but most importantly, how this glaring misconduct has gone unnoticed by any law enforcement agency in the years since Sheena's death. You know, when you write a police report as a police officer, you're swearing that what you're writing is the truth. Well, when you write a fabrication like Diaz has in all of his reports about interviewing people that he's never interviewed, there's no tape recordings to prove it, and there's no written documentation to prove it other than his own word, but 
any of these people that claim that he claimed he interviewed say that they were not interviewed, that's glaringly obvious that he's lying in his police reports. But yet no one takes the stand to deal with that either. And that, that still falls under that uh, United States Code 42 uh, statute 1983. He's still ignoring his duties. And everyone in charge of him is letting him get away with it. So vicariously, they are all responsible for these lies. And no one's changing the story. No one is fixing the problem. That's the problem with that place. And, and like Ira said, we're seeing this all over the country. The FBI got our affidavit. They thought it was a fabulous affidavit, but no one's done anything with it. And that week turned that affidavit over to them a couple of years ago. It didn't take that long to figure out that Diaz and Basil and, and uh, Descari and the chief and Art Brown and the smart team are all guilty of fabricating their police reports. It, it's very obvious, but no one has taken the stand to do anything about it. And people wonder why there's so much distrust in law enforcement. This happens every day in almost every city in the United States. This is why we have the riots. This is why we have the total distrust of law enforcement. It's because it's, it's a constant, and they are allowed to get away with it, and that's what's wrong with it, because the average citizen can't get away with this. If an average citizen lied on a police report, they'd get arrested for filing a false police report. But the police could file false ones all day long, and no one does anything. That's what's wrong. In the next part of the affidavit, the Archangels talk about crime scene technician Jason Smith, who permanently destroyed some of the most important evidence in proving murder or suicide. But some legitimate questions could be raised about what happened in the nearly three hours after Sheena's body had been found on January 1st, 2009. Because it wasn't until 5.15 p.m. Manatee County Sheriff's Office actually dispatched a crime scene technician to the scene. And Jason Smith did not arrive until 5.58 p.m. When he got to the scene, though, he violated Sheena's civil rights because his actions clearly did not follow any of the well-established police procedures and protocols that dictate investigators must first rule out homicide as being the cause of death before determining the cause to be suicide. Without that mindset, critical evidence can be easily overlooked and permanently destroyed. That is exactly what occurred in the Sheena Morris death investigation. I have Sal talk about what could have happened in the three hours it took Detective Diaz to call out a crime scene technician, and also the police protocols when dealing with this type of death investigation. Here, here's the problem when you deal with little tiny, inconsequential little police departments that are nothing more than security guards. They have no experience, they have no knowledge on how to handle a suspicious death, nor do they want to. It's too much work to work a homicide. It's much easier to work a suicide, you know, because the victim's dead and they're not talking and there's nobody around. So what do they do? They go ahead and classify these things as a suicide. Their first response when they got to that hotel room and found that woman dead, that young woman dead in the shower, should have been to back out of that room, not touch anything, secure the area, and immediately call for a crime scene unit. Well, Bradenton Beach doesn't have one. What does that tell you? They don't have the kind of crime rate in that area to support having one. But Manatee County Sheriff's Office does. Manatee County Sheriff's Office is much larger. They could have called the crime scene unit over there and said, look, we have a suspicious death. We don't know what happened. Please send us experienced crime scene unit over here. But to wait three hours like Diaz did? We have no idea what Diaz did in that room prior to the Manatee County Sheriff's crime scene unit coming. We have no idea if he cleaned up things, threw things away, stomped all over the place. Because we're talking about a guy that's so inexperienced, it's a joke, but yet he's a detective sergeant. And then when you read the crime scene unit from Manatee County's report, he's basically told, he was called out to investigate a possible suicide. That's another huge mistake right there. He's saying in his report that whoever called him out sent him, is sending him to a possible suicide. 
not a suspicious death. You know, so they already had their mind made up in that short period of time that Diaz got on the scene without investigating anything, without documenting anything, without interviewing anyone. It's a suicide. You could sit here all day. We could say, should they call them in five minutes? Should they call them in 10 minutes? Should they call them in an hour? You get there and you have a person that's definitely dead under suspicious circumstances, you pick up your radio and you say, I need a detective and I need a crime scene unit out here ASAP. Not three hours later. That that whole thing was, it's so wrong. It's done so wrong. Here we're talking 20, this was 2009, okay? We had in 1992, the crime of the century I think it was 92 when when O.J. Simpson was on trial for his his wife's murder and that young bar um, the waiter from the restaurant, Goldman. Well, during that trial, which lasted months, the best crime scene investigators and the best person in blood spatter in the world was the expert witness for the defense. And he picked apart LAPD's crime scene viciously footprints, blood spatter, fingerprints, DNA. He went over all the shortcomings of that case. Well, since that time, there has been multitudes of schools to make sure crime scene investigators are trained properly. So that doesn't happen again. And here we are in 2009, and the same kind of stuff's happening. Evidence missed, not collected, contaminated, thrown away, and given away. There's something wrong. When Sal and Ira began reviewing the crime scene photos, they were horrified by what they saw on the television. In some of the photos, a college football game is clearly seen on the TV in the background. It is highly unlikely that Sheena was watching ESPN at 2 a.m. on New Year's morning, and that is how the TV was turned on. So this points to the crime scene investigators turning on the TV. While this is not a crime in and of itself, and had the investigators done a thorough review of the crime scene, this would not be a point of contention. But as they did not follow basic investigative procedures, it gives further credence to the lackadaisical attitude and negligence of these so-called investigators. I asked Sal how this was even possible that investigators thought to turn on a football game and what this says about the investigation they performed that day. So it's not a law, but let's face it, you're investigating a death. Think about this for a minute. Why are you watching television? You should be investigating the death. You should be doing complete and thorough investigation, not being distracted by a football game on the television set, which they obviously turned on themselves. So in my opinion, they violated police procedure because of what their actions are completely unprofessional. And then they turn around and they accuse this person of committing suicide and they continue to cover it up and they continually lie about their proper investigation. The point I made about the television set being on and them watching the game was it's the first day of the year, New Year's Day. They don't really care about being there. They want to go home. They want to hang out with their families, watch a football game, drink some beer, or whatever else they had planned for today. They had no time in their minds to investigate this case to be a homicide because it would have took them all day into the night to do this properly, and they didn't want to do it. As we move through the Archangels investigation, we get to January 2nd, 2009, when medical examiner Suzanne Utley performed an autopsy on Sheena. Based on the information provided to her, in large part by the named detectives that we've talked about earlier, she originally determined the cause of death to be suicide by hanging. But over two years later, and after keeping the hyoid bone, Dr. Utley changed the death to undetermined. I asked Sal and Ira to talk about Dr. Utley and their impression of her. Here's what I said about Utley, and I'll stick stand by this. Suzanne Utley is probably a good medical examiner, but her problem is, is like a lot of them. They will sit there and they'll listen to the detective who says, look, this is a suicide. You know, we're pretty convinced that the crime scene indicated this was a suicide. But Suzanne Utley, in, in, her, in her mind, it was suspicious enough to keep... Sheena's hyoid bone. She was suspicious of it. That's why she kept it. 
And then after the second autopsy was performed by Dr. Baden, Suzanne Utley changed her discovery from suicide to undetermined. And the reason she said that was now she's thinking going, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that was missed in the investigation. I cannot put my name on a suicide. I have to change this to undetermined. Because what she's basically saying is, without saying it, the police did such a shitty job investigating this case. I don't know how this girl died. Dan Utley made a mistake by going along with the police department. But she changed her mind after the second autopsy. So at least they give her credit for saying, I made a mistake by ruling that a suicide the first time. She probably, wrestled with, she probably wrestled with it internally for a long time. Sure. Um, she, she knows better. She's a doctor. And when she sees something as suspicious as the hyoid bone being misshaped or something wrong with it, that's what her job is. She's the doctor. And she, she might have brought it out to them and said, you know what? This looks more like a homicide. You better do a little more investigation. And maybe she did. I don't know. She might have said something, but Diaz, as arrogant as he is, and the rest of these clowns with their egos as big as they are, probably just blew her off. Because from when she changed her determination to suicide, that aggravated Diaz. He got pretty upset about that. The next part of the Archangel's affidavit I would like to focus on is the FDLE's involvement in this cover-up. As public pressure continued to mount, bolstered by Sheena's family and Lee Williams, this forced Governor Rick Scott to order the case to be reopened. And on October 9, 2012, a two-page letter was sent to Bradenton Beach Police Chief Sam Special by Shane Pollard, who is the agent in charge of the FDLE investigation. From reading this letter, it is obvious that the FDLE is assisting the Bradenton Beach Police in not reinvestigating Sheena's death. Special Agent Pollard makes no mention of the misconduct by Officers Basil and Security or the incompetent investigation done by Detective Diaz and Crime Scene Technician Smith. Instead of asking important questions about the investigation, the letter concludes with, and I quote, Thank you for your participation in the SMART Team review, and we hope this information will assist in your investigation, end quote. From this letter, it is very clear that FDLE agents are working with the Bradenton Beach Police Department and not investigating their gross incompetence and or corruption. I asked Sal what problems are created by the FDLE saying the Bradenton Beach Police handled this investigation properly. Well, when you look at FDLE's job, like I mentioned this before, there's, FDLE is the Criminal Justice Standards Agency for Florida. They set the... the um, the uh, curriculum for the police academy. They set a lot of the curriculum and courses are approved by them that are taught in advanced classes. And everything that Ira and I have discussed about what's wrong with the Brandon Beach case, if FDLE is going to sit there and set the protocols in all the classes that I've gone to and were trained in, then they should have said Bradenton Beach failed. They failed in the domestic dispute. They failed in the subsequent investigation of her death. And even Manatee County failed to properly investigate her crime scene. But they did none of that. They, they, do, they bring nothing out about the shortcomings of any of the officers involved when they should have. Because really, they discredit themselves. F.D. Lee does. Because every expert that would look at this case, and there have been a number of them, would say the same thing that Ira and I are saying. The police didn't do certain things that should have been done. They omitted so much. They didn't interview people. And when you look at Joe Genoese not getting interviewed the very day they found her dead, 22 days later, they claim they interviewed him, and they didn't really even interview him then. This, this is a case of, of such unprofessional work. And when, when you sit there and you say, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement reviewed this case, and they're going to sit there and basically say nothing's wrong with the investigation that was done. I lose all confidence in Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And then you have a prosecutor who's backing them up. I'm saying to myself, this is another one of these clowns that would put somebody in jail on no evidence at all and lock them up for life. And yet he'll say, oh, well, we can't prosecute Joe Genoese for murder because we have no evidence to, to show that he killed her. Instead of saying, well, because the police did such a shitty job, we have no evidence to prove anything because they destroyed it all. This is the problem with the case. 
It is clear from all the evidence that this case was not properly investigated, but I still cannot figure out what laws were broken. Anybody who has read about this case can see that the Bradenton Beach Police were inept during their investigation, and the FDLE did not address this negligence in their report. But is that a crime? Clearly many of the officers are unfit for duty, but is this something that could actually lead to charges? I have Sal and Ira talk about this. It what goes right told. back to, again, it goes right back to, once again, under the, 40, the U.S. 42, 1983 statute, under the color of law. You got you to gotta grasp what I'm saying. Under the color of law, you as a police officer have the responsibility to protect the rights of the victim and the other citizens in your jurisdiction. When you lie on your police reports and cover up glaring obvious facts, then you are in violation of that statute. That is against the law. And when the police and the prosecutors all conspire together, they're all guilty together. It, it is you know, that simple. Thing, one thing you have to understand, it's all over the country. It's not just in Florida. Sal and I have several murder cases going in Wisconsin. Um, I've got uh, several that I've had for a long time. And we're working on these, and it's the same stuff. The Department of Justice from the state of Wisconsin falsifies documents, lies, covers it up, uh, cherry picks what they want to put in the report and don't put in stuff that will make them look bad. And then they say, here, we've got this report, and, and the key words, we did a thorough and complete investigation. That makes me want to puke every time I hear that because they all write the same thing. It's like somebody's writing their playbook for them. It's the same thing, and it's in – Texas, and it's in Indiana, and it's in California. It's all over the place. The cases that we look at, the same thing. They cover it up, and it goes to the next level, and they play the same game, and nobody gets up there and admits that there's any wrongdoing ever. Next, I have Sal and Ira talk about what they found during their investigation that showed how the FDLE went about writing their report and how their process of interviewing people in Sheena's life was not only flawed, but criminal. You cannot support and conspire to conceal evidence. There's tampering with evidence in this state. There's the, the um, what do you call it? The, um, I'm trying to think of the word I wanted to use with um, fabricating a statement. All of those things, when you say someone said this or someone said that, and then when you go find this person to find that that's not what they said at all, then you're fabricating your reports. You're fabricating what the suspects or what the victims are saying. When you destroy evidence, you are destroying evidence, physical evidence that proves a crime. FDLE is responsible to investigate thoroughly that Bradenton Beach either violated the law or did not. And what Bradenton Beach did was in direct violation of the law. And Florida Department of Law Enforcement, who is charged with investigating any kind of violations, did not do their job. They didn't do it. They are the standard. They hold the standard for Florida law enforcement. If you don't meet the criteria of their standards, then you shouldn't be a police officer. So when they turn around and they back up a bunch of lies like Bradenton Beach did, this group of smart officers, they're just as guilty as the Bradenton Beach officers. It's just, it's, it's just that simple. They're under the color of law lying. They are not telling the truth. They are glossing over facts, and they're ignoring facts. You can't handpick what you want. You can't do that. You know, it's not the actual crimes now. It's the actual cover-up that's the crime. Um, that's what the problem is now. They, they've obstructed justice, filed false reports, done all of that, and those are all in violation of the law. It's a, and it's a cover up. You can't have that. And therein lies the problem with this entire case. This FDLE report is nothing more than public lip service to get us to be quiet. And that has made all the more apparent when they gave Genoese a second polygraph. I asked Sal why the FDLE would spend taxpayer money on a second polygraph test, even though nothing said would be admissible in court. And, and, and the simple fact that the matter is, is when you look at his polygraph. The fact that, you know, Jack Tremarco, world renowned national expert on polygraph, said that Joe Genoese lied in his polygraph. I believe him. But you know what else? 
I don't need a polygraph to know that John, Joe Genoese lies because in, in li listening to any statements he's made throughout the course of this investigation and things he's done clearly shows he lies all the time. It's a matter of habit with him. So when you turn around and F.D. Lee turns around and does another polygraph and they go, no, he didn't lie. He told the truth. And then that polygraphist attacks a national known expert who has five to six times more experience and says that his polygraph was wrong. He shouldn't have asked certain questions. Who is this rookie to say what the experts knew is wrong? See, and this is, again, another violation of the family civil rights because they continually conspire to destroy the case and make Joe Genoese look like an innocent party while Sheena looks like she committed suicide. This is the, all they want to do is discredit the victim and discredit the family's claims because it makes they think it makes them look good by destroying the family and, and, and the victim. They're just, they're, they gains nothing. The evidence is clear that FDLE agents, with all of their experience, training, and credentials, but never mentioned in their case summary that proper investigative procedures and protocols dictate a comprehensive examination of a person who died under suspicious circumstances. Their conduct can only be construed as a deliberate act of cover-up and obstruction of justice. I asked Sal what a court case against the FDLE would look like, how it would play out, and what it would take to make this happen. If you were to take this in the courtroom for, say, a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit against the police officers, a monetary damages for you know, the uh, civil rights violations, the jury would have to hear all the evidence. You know, they'd have to look at our affidavit. They'd have to make decisions based on what the Florida Department of Law Enforcement claimed they did versus what actually was done. As far as interviews were concerned, they'd have to listen to every tape statement that was taken of people that were telling a story completely opposite of what the police said, but yet the police said they said a certain thing. Uh, the same with the physical evidence. They're going to say, well, at some point, this jury is going to be educated by the various experts that, yes, the footwear in, or her, her foot impression should have been should have been taken off the shower floor to see if she walked in or was dragged in they're going to say that well if you didn't do that how do you know she wasn't dragged in that's going to question them they're going to look at the the leash the way the leash was attached on the the shower head and go gee that doesn't make sense how could that have withstood her any great force of her dropping herself down to hang herself as we mentioned before she this woman died from strangulation. She didn't hang herself. So there's, there's so many variables in this case that a grand jury would come back or a jury of, of trying this in a, in, a, in a civil court would say upon the preponderance of the evidence, the police are guilty of not doing their jobs. They're negligent. And then they created this conspiracy to cover up their mistakes or, or their purposeful negligence. And they would award the family money, but it would take a, a great deal of, of investigation on the part of the um, the defense attorney, you know, to have every every witness lined up and ready to go. Depositions have to be taken. This would cost a fortune at this stage to get it in front of a, a civil court. Is there a case? Hell yes, there's a case. There's a huge case here. With the right law firm, they would win this case. But whether or not you know, Sheena Morris's uh, family has the financial um, wherewithal to bring to bear the legal team that it would take to get this in front of a courtroom. It, that that's a tough one. It, it takes money sometimes to get justice, and it shouldn't because the FBI and the FDLE, who are paid by the tax dollars, should be the Overwatch Committee when a police department screws up like this, and they should come in looked at this case and said, you know what? You guys screwed up big time, Braden and Beach. You left out a lot of stuff you shouldn't have left out. They shouldn't have sat there and, and babysat them and then supported all the views. They should have tore it apart like we did. That's what they should have done. They didn't do it. So it goes back to what Ira said. Who, who told them to just make this go away rather than 
go down there and find out what the real problem is. And if there's a problem, we need to straighten it out. And they didn't do that. It is very difficult to prove that anyone in this case is criminally liable, but proving guilt in a civil court is much easier. And I have Sal talk about the difference between the two. We're going to go right back to the rules of civil law is different than criminal law. Criminal law is you have to find beyond any reasonable doubt that this person's guilty before you can convict. Now, in civil court, that's not the case. In civil court, they say the preponderance of the evidence leans towards guilt or innocence. Now, in this case, the preponderance of the evidence is so overwhelming towards guilt on the part of the police, they would lose their ass in a courtroom. The final line from the conclusion section is one of the most misleading statements in the entire report, but unfortunately true. After talking about how Sheena was a suicide risk throughout the entire report, the final line reads, and I quote, there is no evidence of homicide. That statement should be amended to say there is no evidence of homicide or suicide because of the negligent actions of Detective Leonard Diaz, crime scene technician Jason Smith, and police chief Sam Special. The FDLE should have requested an inquiry into the techniques used by the Bradenton Beach Police so events like this never take place again. I spoke with Lee Williams about how often the FDLE gets involved in cases and his impression of their work. Has been uh, this. This is my the first time I have seen FDLE come in on a case that I have uh, chronicled. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in my mind, and I cannot speak to how they operate as an organization. But unfortunately, uh, this in this case, they seemed more concerned with uh, preserving the status quo of the police department than they did at at, at finding out the truth. Uh, they and uh, the assistant state attorney up in Manatee County, Arthur Brown. Based upon what I've read and the incredible investigation that they did, and, and I'm putting incredible in finger quotes because it was so bad, seemed only focused on providing cover for the shoddy, shoddy investigation by Bradenton Beach PD. They, I mean, you don't attack the victim's family. You don't go after the victim's family in, a, in an investigation. They're sacrosanct. They just lost a loved one, yet they seemed uh, hell-bent. On, on crucifying Kelly and Sheena's friends and and things like that. I mean, the, the minute that FDLE report came out, my phone lit up. Friends of Sheena and and the Morris family uh, were screaming that hey, these agents had twisted their words. They had said things, and the agents were completely twisting it to suit their needs. An investigation, you know, is, is a search for the truth. It's not a it's not an ass covering, which is what they tried to do. Uh, and then the, the the whole thing was based on on experts with the with terrible credentials and this polygraphist who uh, blasted uh, the FB one of the premier uh, polygraphists in the country. This thing was hyper focused on one thing: making Kelly and Sheena's family go away. Art Brown is the last person I would like to talk about in the Archangels of Justice affidavit and the laws he broke during his investigation. His first violation of Florida Code is covered under the Ethical and Professional Responsibility Rules for Lawyers and Judges, which states, A lawyer shall not engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Art Brown does this in his report when he attacks not only the experts, including Jan Johnson and Jack Chamarco, but also the family itself. Being a prosecutor in Florida, he must have known that in his state, suicide is a crime and must be proven. So any statement regarding a suicide that he cannot prove with physical evidence is in violation of the statute. Also, his interview with Joe Genoese proves his intention was not to find the truth, but to assist in the cover-up. I have Sal and Ira talk about their impression of the Genoese interview conducted by Art Brown, and if he would be found guilty in a civil suit. Well, my opinion of Art Brown's interview of Joe Genoese was not an interview, it was a conversation. Joe Genoese really didn't answer very many questions. Art Brown led him through the interview like a bull by the nose. And he already knew what he was going to say because they spoke for an hour before. So in my opinion, I think Art Brown is unethical, unprofessional, and, and he doesn't deserve to hold the position of a state prosecutor because he, his questioning technique was not even questioning. Is it illegal? It probably borders on, a, once again, in a civil courtroom. 
if a jury was to hear that tape, which they would, they would probably sit there and chuckle and say, what interview? This guy didn't interview anybody. And he had everything that Joe Genoese said disparaged Sheena, but he had no proof to back any of it up. Not not one bit, of, not one shred of what Genoese said was provable in a courtroom. But you know, Art Brown you, took it as gospel. What you have to understand in there is Art Brown is their homicide expert prosecutor. That's his uh, he forte. He, that's what he claims. So under the circumstances... If he's an expert in prosecuting, he certainly could have asked better questions of Genoese, and mm-hmm. he didn't. He didn't. And that's why I say a civil courtroom, this is where the family would be beneficial, would be in a civil courtroom, because it's preponderance of the evidence of guilt rather than the beyond a reasonable doubt of guilt. And that's why we have two different sets of courtroom procedures. You know, I mean, do they, like go back to O.J. Simpson. He was found innocent in the murder trial in the criminal court, but he was found guilty in the civil court as being responsible for the deaths of of uh, Goldman and his wife Nicole. You know, two different levels of proof. The civil one is the lesser because it's a monetary collection rather than an imprisonment. I would like to close out this episode and the Archangel's affidavit by reading the conclusion from their investigation, and I'm quoting directly from their report here. It is clear that officers Basil and Sakiri deliberately failed to perform their sworn duties by not taking proper action at an obvious domestic violence scene, destroyed the report Sheena Morris had filled out, and then created a false report to cover up their inappropriate actions. Then, Bradenton Beach Police Detective Leonard Diaz and Manatee County Sheriff's Office crime scene technician Jason Smith failed to properly investigate and collect all evidence related to Sheena's death. That appears to just be incompetent or inept police work. Finally, representatives of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the State Attorney's Office, while claiming to have conducted a painstaking and thorough investigation, worked only to hide the truth and protect Bradenton Beach Police, Manatee County Sheriff's Department, and those officers and detectives from criminal and civil liabilities. The Archangels of Justice and the Morris family hereby allege those actions constitute a cover-up of the truth and are criminal acts. They also violated the civil rights of Sheena Morris, Kelly Osborne, and Dave Morris. That is where I'm going to leave off for this week. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join us next week for the final episode of the Sheena Morris case. In the last episode, we will be joined by a few different people in Sheena's life talking about her and the way the FDLE misrepresented their statements. We will also talk about the theories of what we think actually happened that morning and update our listeners on where the case is at today. A special thanks to Mike Mack, who did all the music for this podcast. If you'd like to hear more samples of Mike Mack's work, you can go to his website, www.mike.com dash mac.com or you can follow him on twitter at mike mac thank you to our sponsors blueberry and totalfrontpage.com please support them as they have supported this podcast from the very beginning if you're interested in learning more about this case you will soon find all the evidence and documentation used in this podcast at archangelsofjustice.org slash podcast for updates about future episodes and cases follow us on twitter at archangelpod and on Facebook under Archangels of Justice. If you'd like to send us an email, you can reach us at podcast at archangelsofjustice.org. If you're listening on iTunes or SoundCloud, we would appreciate it if you left us a positive review. Thank you again for listening to the Archangels of Justice case files, and we look forward to having you here next week.